Sometimes it feels like the sun will never rise, like the birds will never sing. That's right. When you don't know what to do, just keep on breathing from Los Angeles, the city of angels, and from the Big Apple in, in New York City, actually Fire Island, which is kind of the Big Apple. Maybe it's the apple seed. Welcome <laughs> to all my listeners out there in Radio Land. I'm Dave, the caregiver's caregiver at caregiverdave.com, along with my lovely co-host, Adrian Gruber, at the caregiverspace.org. And we are coming to you live and on demand 24-7 on numerous syndicated radio podcasts and 26 global audio platforms, including iHeartRadio, iTunes, YouTube, Spreaker, SoundCloud, Vimeo, Stitcher, and a whole bunch more. And we are proud to be voted number one caregiver podcast of the top 50 on Player FM and number two caregiver podcast on Feedspot out of the top 60 and number two caregiver podcast on caringvillage.com and number two tries harder, right? And we have an especially exciting show planned for you today, don't we, Adrian? Yes, we do. Yes, we do. <laughs> yes, Four Habits of Hope. How do you find hope in difficult times? Susan Zimmerman, a licensed marriage and family therapist and certified clinical trauma professional. She's the author of six books, count them. Her recently released book is Rays of Hope, Lighting the Way in Life's Transitions and Losses. Perfect for caregivers. <laughs> Today, she'll be with us uh, on four habits of hope and how to recognize phases of grief when you're in a difficult life transition and caregiving can certainly be difficult. Yes. Where were you when I needed you, Susan? Mm. 20, 21, 25. I don't know. How many years has it been? <laughs> a lot. Yeah. A couple of decades at least. But before we get started, I want to take this moment to thank my last week's guests, Bobby Doe and Lori LaParl connecting caregivers to those who need one and vice versa. And just a reminder, you can watch or listen to that interview and all our interviews, including this one on our membership website, caregiverdave.com or on any of those 26 global networks that I mentioned earlier. Okay, enough of that. Susan, welcome to the show. And we're so excited to have you on. Thanks so much, Dave. I appreciate you having me. Oh, look, you got all dolled up for us. <laughs> <laughs> well, this just, is my favorite outfit. <laughs> I just switched my computer to the screen and I saw you for the first time there. You look great. Oh, okay, great. We Thank should all you. look that great. <laughs> <laughs> so I always like to ask my guest, just who is uh, Susan Zimmerman and why was she placed on this earth? Ooh. Ooh, ooh. I'm supposed to know that? <laughs> sure, right off the top of your head. <laughs> well, I... Yes, I have had a nice long career that has blended both financial planning and therapeutic communication. So mm. I think I was put on earth primarily to encourage and educate people because I have found that sometimes we don't have the highest self literacy that we could have. And so getting to know yourself and modifying things when needed and appreciating things when they are deserving is an important factor that some of us are too busy or too preoccupied to do. So I try to help bring that. Well, good for you. The world needs that and caregivers need that. Now, I'm <laughs> Boy, just reading my notes here. I understand you've been dubbed the queen of acronyms. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're, you're probably a, a good rapper too, I guess, huh? <laughs> so can you share how you started getting that reputation and what favorite acronym of yours might be for, well, I don't know, say caregivers? Sure, sure. Thank you for that question. The, the acronyms began partly because of just wanting to make fun of different industries because <laughs> they're so full of abbreviations and acronyms that it drives you crazy. Yes. But then also there were all these mnemonics that were part of study guides for the many, many exams I had to take for different licenses and things. And I was frustrated by mnemonics because it's really a lot of times just a bunch of letters together that don't spell a meaningful word. So I started creating meaningful acronyms from important words like CARE. So to address your question about what would be a good acronym for caregivers is one that I came up with 
one of the times when my mother called, she, I was her primary caregiver for eight years. And I always felt an elevated anxiety anytime I saw her on my phone. <laughs> That's normal <laughs> I, with mothers, by the way. Yeah. I, well, well, before, yeah, it was, I always knew that if she was calling me instead of me calling her, it meant something was wrong. So I, I changed her from her picture on the phone to a stained glass window to remind me of this acronym, which is instead of panicking, start with the C in care is compassion. Compassion first, because although I, get, I was getting caught up in my role as caregiver, what she needed first thing off the bat was compassion. I think that's true as we are caregivers. Second is acceptance. That's a tough one because things do not happen as you might have imagined or as you had hoped or expected. And we have to you know, very quickly get into acceptance mode as caregivers. And then third is the R in care for readiness. Like we have to be perpetually ready because Nobody knows what kinds of medical emergencies are going to happen, especially when you have a diagnosed illness or you are in the elderly population. We have to be ready for that. I've been noticing that myself. And then finally, the E is energy. Like find whatever scraps you can muster to <laughs> be able to do the, uh, the other three, compassion, acceptance, readiness, and energy. So that's my favorite acronym for care. Wow. I'm, gonna, I'm writing that down because I had a, an acronym for care as well, slightly different from yours. Oh. Um, not just a one word thing. Uh, C st stood for um, communicate with your loved ones. Uh, don't isolate yourself. A mm -hmm. stood for ask for help. Uh, mm. R stood for, what was R, Adrian? Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> I know I've our, forgotten a few of mine too. <laughs> our, uh, oh my gosh. I, rest? I, I've only done this. Yes. Rest. Of course. Oh, Caregivers need eight good. hours rest every single night. Good, uh, I was caregiver gets two or three and E stands for eat, eat healthy foods. Don't eat junk foods. Junk foods got sugar, processed ingredients. Yeah. All that stuff will kill you. And so well, uh, I like yours also. I think those could be a good pairing because you're focused <laughs> Well, I'll on, steal yours, you steal mine. Yeah, but I mean, it's good because yours remind the caregiver to take care of themselves. Yeah. Whereas mine was designed more out of like, when something That's happens, cool. be ready with compassion, acceptance, readiness, and energy. Yeah, so, like that. yeah, that's, that's a good, good couple there, I'd say. See, we're networking. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Now, you've noted that caregivers often experience a form of pre-grieving, which mm -hmm. Adrian likes to call that anticipatory grief. Well, yes. Explain. Yes, I've it's called it that. Yeah. It, it's, it is. It's similar to anticipatory anxiety. So I appreciate <laughs> that capturing of it, Adrian. And what I've, what I've identified in that pre-grieving is there is just this unsettled, and kind of empty feeling as you begin to take in that you are preparing for a loss. Mm -hmm. so it's, it's anticipating, gosh, what's it going to be like when I lose this person? And even if it's not a cognitive thinking process, there is a physiological response that happens and it can range from aches. It can be very much like the flu. When my really? dad was diagnosed with terminal cancer, I, I really did think I had the flu after I had visited him and he had lost, you know, ma many, many pounds of weight. And that's one of the first obvious things that happened. And I thought I had the flu, but the flu didn't go away. So those aches <laughs> and even a, a nausea that was kind of back and forth in and out. Those are things that I called pre grieving because mm. it, I had to realize, oh, this too is grief. It's not just all the emotions yeah. and sadness. The proverbial doctor telling you, well, you're, you're perfectly fine. It's all in your head. I know. I love when they say that. <laughs> so I'm really curious. A lot, of it, a lot of it is in your head. A lot yeah. of it is in your head. And somehow it trickles down into the exactly. rest of your body. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So, so I think that being aware, any time we can grow our awareness around things that 
might very likely be on their way. It just helps to be prepared emotionally and physically and then remember not to put yourself last on the list every uh -huh. single time. Yeah. I'm curious uh, what your four habits of hope, H-O-P-E, uh, I bet you have an acronym for that, and yeah. how they can help uh, our <laughs> listeners and viewers. Yes. Pretty soon you're going to have to crown me with that queen of acronyms. <laughs> <laughs> I hereby do crown you queen of acronyms. So hope, can, you've hope been knighted. Helps. I think, you know, especially when you're actively grieving, and I always point out that transitions, change of any kind can trigger grief cycles. And the four habits of hope to help anyone through it is to start by respecting, in other words, honor the emotions that are coming to you instead of trying to push them down or ignore them. It isn't about being, you know, completely getting caught up in that, but being aware of it and respecting what you need to do to take care of yourself. Mm -hmm. So that's honoring for the age. And then O is for being open to what it might be teaching you, because even when things feel awful, you might be learning something that you'll have to be ready for again in the future, or that can help you remedy things in a way that you wouldn't have been able to. So being open to all of those lessons. The P is for persevering, which is different from being open to things, but persevering is when we, in some respects, have to stubbornly continue on when things are difficult even when we very obviously don't feel like it, but it's like just finding a way to pick yourself up and kind of like that E for energy, which is find just enough energy to persevere. And then the E is for encouraging and encourage mm. means <clears throat> to infuse courage. So I, I often say we can't have courage without having fear. So that in that case, the E is for finding a way to notice the, the bravery that we can muster and apply it to specific situations as needed. So that's what the four habits of hope are. I, I think they're very useful. I just, <clears throat> I just moved. Well, I haven't moved. I'm, I'm transitioning. And um, I left the home that my late husband of 10, he died 10 years ago. But uh, I left the home that we built together. Oh, and yeah. it's like finding, finding things that I didn't know that he had you know, and a new insight into somebody that's, that's been gone. And every, every aspect of packing and giving things away was, was grieving, but it's not necessarily bad to grieve. It's how you right. deal with it. Absolutely. That's why I always say honor the emotional experience of it, because so many of them are unfamiliar and maybe unexpected. So they have that unsettling or painful element, but it doesn't mean to try to escape them or get rid of them. And I think one of the main reasons I've written and talk about this is to help people find healthy ways to deal with the very uncomfortable elements of grief and loss, and that happens during caregiving, instead of reaching for a drink or drugs and that kind of thing, because I, I have seen that a lot in my practice. Absolutely. Yeah. By the way, Adrian, I totally uh, agree with you about moving. In fact, moving is in, it's in this book. It, there's a poem and a little chapter on moving being a moving experience because of, Very. <laughs> yeah, because of what you find and, and it's going through that, that unexpected of like, why, why am I doing this again? Where you start to question 
why why did I make this decision? And yeah, so. <laughs> I'm still wondering. But <laughs> yeah, moving is a moving experience. That's the name yeah. of the chapter in the poem. <laughs> yeah. So let's talk about poetry. Poetry is in your book, right? Yes, it is. And poetry was something that I was discovering that with clients, when it had a a meaningful purpose embedded in it would reach places, deep places that otherwise a lot of conversation wasn't reaching. And that's when I started researching, does poetry help people therapeutically? And thank goodness for things like MRIs these days, people did studies on the brain when a person was reading or reciting a poem. And the brain was lighting up in these MRIs the same way when you listen to music or anything huh. highly impactful, but it has that artistic soothing flow to it. So the reason wasn't necessarily crystal clear, but just unmistakable that the brain did, the brain was saying, yes, I like this. Give me more. <laughs> what, what's your favorite poem? Oh, yes. Well, I do have a poem about hope. Uh, I like I like poems that the the message is easier to grasp. I I never liked the huge symbolic things. I like it to be fairly easy to get. So I have two. One one is on hope and it's it especially occurred to me cuz I was writing this book during the pandemic but I had started it before there ever was a pandemic. So mm -hmm. I did not expect that during this time. And so what I was seeing all of us go through, it really created this poem and it's called Hope. It was once a wish, a love, or an aim. Holding tight didn't assure a forever claim to familiar comforts with nothing changed of never having to be rearranged. Amidst the turmoil, along came new hope, slowly nudging us up the steep slope of coping mm -hmm. with loss and changed conditions, lighting the way for our new life's transitions. So that's, that's the that's hope beautiful. poem. beautiful. So my brain was probably lighting up when, when you were reading <laughs> yeah. it, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, if only we could do that. Well, if it's not enough to just do Zoom and get that set up, <laughs> like let's have an MRI going on too. <laughs> Oh. Uh, and then I have a short one about, I had mentioned that I think, you know, you can't have courage without also experiencing fear, because that's what courage is. Right. And it's, it's the, the path to courage is blazed by fear. We can't have one unless the other is near. Persistently then toward each will steer, embracing both and holding them dear. So... I wrote that with the therapeutic intention of, I think oftentimes we, our reaction to fear is sort of a hatred, like make it stop and you want it to go away just like other painful emotions. You wish you could just eliminate them. And instead it's like, if we can remember that, hey, this fear is here and I, it's up to me to find just enough courage to, work through it in the healthiest way possible. So I'm all for just finding healthy ways of coping and instead of lapsing into unhealthy ones. I'm, I'm guessing that you recommend music also, right? Yeah, mu I don't have any to recommend specifically because I think it's such a unique... Oh, I thought you were going to sing us a song. Oh. <laughs> it's a very personal thing, music. Yeah. 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 I tend to like musicals and I I've noticed that with Alexa, I'm, I ask <laughs> for never enough a lot, which was from, I think it's called the greatest showman, but it was because that artist had the, the singer has such a powerful, powerful, incredible voice that it, it wasn't in that case, the lyrics necessarily that got me, but just her powerful, incredible voice. And that's still a favorite. Yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, my first 45 was love potion number nine. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> uh, yeah. 
we might be in about the same class. <laughs> <laughs> so you're a fan of writing thoughts out to help with difficulties. What are the most yeah. helpful prompts for grief? Well, thank you for that question, Dave. I, I found this when a, a young person who was close to our family died suddenly back and she was only 24. And I found a writing exercise that I turned into an acronym to, that was helping to get a grip on just the, the long time that grief can last. And GRIP is an acronym it makes it, it easier <laughs> to remember the questions to journal to and at the very least think through it. But it's acknowledging what is gone because what happens in mm. grief is there's this perpetual swirl where you, it's like you keep remembering over and over again. Oh, that's it's either new things added to the list that you miss or just the the reality setting in yet again. So when you write it out, it becomes a bit more finite. So what is gone? What remains? You've got to for sure go into what remains so that you recognize that not all, all of your favorite things in life are over. You have, you're recognizing that there are still things that matter, that bring your life meaning. And then finally, what is possible? What are things that I might discover during this loss or even as a result of this loss that are I never would have found out had it not happened? And I've found that with various times of significant grief in my life, there's almost always something that is a new element when I answer and write out what is possible. So it it is in a way like your own gratitude journal because by writing out what's gone, you can recognize it and continue on what remains. You see the positives that are still there. Mm -hmm. And then that what is possible really does, you ask at the front of this, what, what is the reason I'm on earth or what any person is? And yeah. it's like constantly having to reinvent where you're going, where you're going to put yourself each day. So that's what I think is most valuable. Wow. You, you say that uh, grief phrases and commonalities are N-E-A-R, near? Uh, yeah. Can you explain that? Yeah, sure. Well, I, I had studied uh, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, the stages uh. of grief in grad school. Now, that was back in the previous century, so in the 90s. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> She's not alive anymore, right? So I kept memorizing them, and then I'd have to remember again. And so, of course, I ended up thinking, well, what really would be an acronym that would, would capture the primary sim similar or um, features of grief? And so NEAR stands for NUMB, and NUMB captures... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> I'm lighting my face with my phone. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so near is for the numbness and that initial form of denial because of the shock. And E is for emotional, which is the many emotions that some of them you maybe have felt before, but some are brand new and very unsettling. So emotional. But the A in near is for adjusting. And I use the word adjusting instead of acceptance, like Kubler-Ross uses acceptance. I think adjusting has some natural defenses that, that, that make it more reliable and easy to say, yes, I can, I'll just start I, making yeah. adjustments as opposed to I must accept this because mm -hmm. eventually that will lead typically to adjustment. And then finally rebuilding. So rebuilding is when you really do start to face the future again, make new plans, taking new action. Not unlike what you mentioned about moving, Adrian. It was 10 years later, but mm -hmm. you know that's part of the continuous adjusting. And so it's taking adjustments and accepting it as it goes along. So numb emotional, it, adjusting, and rebuilding. There are steps throughout after someone passes there there are steps for years Absolutely. they come you know they come when they're ready i think 
Yeah. You know, like uh, the the adjusting, mm -hmm. I didn't have a problem with. I know a lot of people do. It's all just part of life. And you, you, you just have to be resilient. Absolutely. And, and realize that something else is going to happen. Mm -hmm. And there is a future. That's the way I thought about it. Even even when Steve was was dying, I mean, I I I knew I was going to be alone, and I knew that I was going to have to make these adjustments. But when it happened, I wasn't shocked. You know, yeah, yeah. I was ready for it. Mm -hmm. And that meant a lot, the fact that I was prepared. Mm -hmm. Adrian brings was, up a good point. Um, you know, I get in trouble, not a lot of times. Like one time I got in trouble because I was encouraging this, this friend at church who's been grieving the loss of her fiancé for five years. I mean, oh. his picture's still on Facebook. And I just kind of oh, tried yeah. to, as compassionately as I could, you know, maybe it's time to move on. And I mean, she just chopped my head off. Oh, Everybody boy. grieves at their own time. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah, so if yeah. two people are grieving the same loss, let's say they, they lost a loved one to death. Um, mm -hmm. Are they going through the same grief process? Why does one take longer or shorter than another? I think that is such an important question because so very often the more you are in a close relationship, say two of you, like mm -hmm. say uh, in your case, if you have children, Adrian, a child is grieving the loss of their father sure. and you were grieving the loss of your husband, but a very close family member. So it's like the closer you are, or if two parents lose a child or even a friend of a child, which is what happened for us, the, the expectation is that you would be very similar if you both were sort of equally close, that your grief would be similar. And that's when the some disharmony or conflict can start to happen because once again, it was an expectation that snuck in. These come in from our unconscious mind. We aren't trying to have, you know, conflict in a relationship or confusion about somebody who doesn't seem to be grieving in a way that would be appropriate or or right and that's what seems to happen when the loss is profoundly significant and uh, two or more members of a family expect each other to be very similar but mm -hmm. similarity is something you're not typically going to find so the timetables vary the type of emotions that seem to take over where one person might be prone to anger. Another one is prone to feeling fearful. Like, what am I going to do now? How will I continue in the future? So those differences need to be honored. It's sort of like right out of the hope part and try to catch yourself if it's an expectation that is causing you know, difficulty with another person. One of the very best definitions of forgiveness that I received at a con conference on forgiveness was that forgiveness is releasing an expectation that's causing you to suffer. Mm -hmm. So I think when people are grieving, just be aware of your own grief and be very respectful of other people's way of going about it. Mm -hmm. I think the one it an exception and it's tricky to to know how to converse about it but if you see someone damaging themselves like drinking <laughs> too much any again back to the unhealthy choices then that's where some therapeutic intervention would probably be a good idea but it's very tough to say to somebody i think you need a therapist there are ways to, to <laughs> say it <laughs> you know I don't know if you want me to go into that or not, but that's no, that's, that's okay. One. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, I th I think when you find somebody that's that's turned to opioids or or alcohol to to uh, deal with grief, and you see it happening, and you want to help, 
you say something so that they'll answer you and you can listen and they're talking, I think is important. I mean, do you have any tips for being a better listener? I think, well, (laughs) since we've acknowledged (laughs) that I have an acronym for a lot of subjects, I I do, uh, I have recommended ACE as the acronym for being a better listener. And ACE means, to excel at something. So in this case, the focus is on listening. And first, it's about asking, asking questions that will provide some meaningful dialogue back. And then the C in ACE is for confirming or clarifying. So you're responding back. And by by knowing that you need to confirm back what you just heard them say, that forces you to listen because you just have to keep thinking my job is to listen here and to be able to provide what I've heard back. And then finally, um, it, in ACE that is encouraging at the end. So sometimes if you're talking to someone who's grieving, the encouragement could be as simple as I'm so thankful for you. I know this is a painful time. I've told my employees that the more stumped you are by something that someone says, that's when the the best thing you can fall back on is thanking them, thanking them for what they just shared with you. Because sometimes if somebody tells us something that's just so shocking, you know you've gone like, oh my gosh, what do I say to this or how do I respond? <laughs> you can thank them. Thank them for having you be a person they confide in and that you are grateful. And then you can, usually that prompts for you as the speaking person or the respondent, what what can come best as a result. So yeah, being an ACE listener is, is important. And yeah. I think by even just, asking you know if there's anything that they care to share with you based on how things have been going lately when it comes to grief i tend to suggest not asking how are you you know right. and leaving it so wide open but just instead saying how have the last couple of days been for you and that way it narrows it so yeah. they don't have to think about everything think yeah. of it as the big heavy question and then the big heavy answer so. Yeah. You know, uh, coincidentally, I use that uh, technique quite often at the gas station whenever there's a customer who's being a <laughs> real jerk. You oh, know, and he'll, yeah. He'll just uh, say, well, yeah, I don't know. And I'll just smile and say, thank you for sharing that. Have a nice day. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it works. I mean, you know, they, they're disarmed because they were expecting me to react and fight back. Mm-hmm. Well, I don't know where the time has gone, but we have uh, exhausted our time together. And I am so grateful that you are on the show. We covered a lot of stuff. Um, no, we did. If somebody wants to get a hold of you and pick your brain some more, what's the best way to do that? Well, I, I tend to be an email person. It's <laughs> Susan at mindfulplanning.com. So email is a great way to, to start off and you can visit my website, which is mindfulplanning.com. Awesome. And I love your hairdresser, by the way. They did a great job. Oh, I'll tell her. (laughs) You tell her that I said so. (laughs) Yeah, the curl is natural, so that part. Uh, (laughs) I got it. (laughs) Adrian, how do we get a hold of you if somebody wants to find out more about the caregiver space and all of your forums that you've got going on over there? It's an amazing place. We have a new new one on transitions. Transitions. So, and that's Great. yeah. Um it's Adrian at the caregiverspace.org. And the caregiverspace.org is the website, and the caregiver space is where you would go on Facebook. So yes. and she has a lot of followers. How many are you up to now? It's almost six hundred and fifty thousand. Yeah. Oh my gosh, that's a half a million, uh-huh. over half a million. Uh-huh. Over, over. It, yeah. And she did that in the olden days when it was harder and there was there was no, uh, you know, ana- analytics and all that stuff. Anyway. Well, when, they, when they changed their algorithm, they actually cut at least 100,000 off. 
So I don't know how they did it. So we built it back up. Oh, yeah. Man. In it's spite great. of that, yeah, you're, you're yeah. still growing. Good for you. Great. And I'm at uh, caregiverdave.com. Pretty simple. It's uh, I got three free gifts for people who want to go on my free membership website for support and everything. And so we thank everybody for tuning in. We'll see you again next time. Same time, same channel. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Dave Nassani, the caregiver's caregiver, has just released his sixth book entitled It's My Life Too. Thrive to Stay Alive as a Caregiver. It was specifically written for caregivers who know they should be putting their needs first, but just don't know how. Dave is the sole caregiver to his wife, Charlene, since 1996. He knows firsthand what caregivers are going through because he is one. He now speaks all across the country, offering caregivers his amazing caregiver support package. Even the airlines tell us that in the event of an emergency, to put your oxygen mask on first before you help your child with their mask. They know that those who don't heed their advice often black out, thus becoming unable to help either themselves or their child. And caregivers are exactly the same way. It's my life too. Thrive and stay alive as a caregiver will help caregivers who are neglecting their sleep, diet, and social life and learn to put their needs first. Pick up your copy today or buy one for your special caregiver on sale everywhere and at caregiverdave.com. Sometimes it feels like the sun will never rise, like the birds will never sing again. Keep breathing, take it in and let it out. Keep breathing.